Welcome wherever you are in the world. Welcome whatever you're listening to this on, whether it's your hi-fi at home, whether it's your phone on the train or the plane. I hope you're going somewhere nice. This is the second Hot Topics podcast from MB Medical. My name is Neil Tucker and I'll be taking you through the next 20 minutes as we review what's been going on in the last couple of weeks relevant to us in primary care in the medical news and the journals. So it's November the 1st and this means that many of you will have been out last night pounding the streets. No, not on some early election campaign trail because we failed to leave the European Union last night. No, this is because of course it was Halloween. I took my own kids to a friend's Halloween party but made the mistake of leaving a pumpkin lit outside the front of my house. This I have found out in recent years is the universal signal for saying, please come to my house, you can have all the sweets in it. So you can imagine the carnage when there was no one here to satiate their sugar cravings. This explains why the front of my house now looks like someone's made a really bad omelette and then tried to clean it up with loo paper. If anyone knows a good local window cleaner, please send them my way. So in the podcast today, we're going to have a look at some of the news from the last couple of weeks, including ranitidine prescribing, new research on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, rehab after uh, TIA. We're going to have a more in-depth look at this new research showing that antihypertensives are more effective if taken at bedtime. We're going to explore the whole thing about dippers and non-dippers at night time. We're also going to have a look at a couple of other cardiovascular topics which I think uh, have gone under the radar here. And then we're going to finish up with looking at a new gene editing technology which once again pushes the boundaries of medical science. So firstly in the clinical news then one of the big stories was that ranitidine has been immediately recalled and this is from a number of drug manufacturers throughout the UK and uh, globally and this is due to concerns about contamination with NDMA. Now when I first heard this I thought all oh, right so they've got some ecstasy in it that might explain some of the erratic behavior I get from some of my patients. But no, it's not MDMA, it's NDMA, which um, is something you definitely don't want to take at a rave because it's a probable human carcinogen and clearly pretty bad news. So ranitidine is gone for the foreseeable future with no indication at all of when it might be uh, returning to market again. This is why we've all been scrabbling around over the last couple of weeks to review our patients taking ranitidine and see if they A, still genuinely require the medication and B, if they do, then switch them to some appropriate alternative. And the suggestion has been that this shouldn't be an alternative H2 receptor antagonist. The stocks of those are not that great in the UK anyway. So instead to think about using a PPI, uh, a meprazole 20 milligrams if it's for gastroprotection. The biggest non-clinical topic has of course been to do with the BMA and publication of the independent report demonstrating sexual discrimination. It's a pretty damning report and while it's certainly true that possibly even the majority of people weren't directly involved in discriminatory behaviour, it seems that there is certainly a culture that allowed this to happen and a failure of people being brought to task about it. So hopefully this will lead to some change in the organisation which is what the BMA have already promised. It may be up to us to hold them to task to make sure that actually happens. There's been a fair bit in the news this week about the NHS app, which was launched last year as a way for patients to be able to access NHS services and particularly general practice. And now the majority of GP practices are linked with the app. I downloaded it this week and my first surprise was that it actually worked. It was pretty straightforward. You've got to have your practice details but once you've had those which you may have had to sign up to other online tools such as patient access which is what my own local practice use then the whole process is pretty straightforward and it was quite easy to navigate it doesn't seem to have uh, much additional functionality over what I've already been using with patient access but one of the real bonuses that I think will become more and more important is that it does initially signpost patients to self-help and alternatives to primary care and I think with people often coming to us with very very minor problems 
this is a welcome thing. So hopefully there'll be quite widespread adoption amongst patients. Two bits of research that caught my eye this week. Firstly, we had in the New England Journal of Medicine a paper looking at the role of angiotensin neprilysin inhibition for patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. So that's sacubitral valsartan, which we may be becoming more familiar with these days as part of fairly standard management of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Does it work in patients with preserved ejection fraction heart failure? Short answer, no. It joins the growing list of drugs that fail to improve mortality or hospitalizations in this type of heart failure. We're still on the lookout for a good treatment here. So we talk about this on the current Hot Topics course and the best thing we can do at the moment is try and improve those modifiable risk factors as best as we can. And there are studies currently underway looking at the role of SGLT2 inhibitors for this group of patients. They've demonstrated benefit in people with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction and the hope is that they may do it for this other type as well. The second piece of research was published in the BJGP and this was a pilot study of a randomised controlled trial uh, looking at patients who'd had a recent TIA and then um, delivering a novel home-based prevention programme called the Healthy Brain Rehabilitation Manual. This contains information about TIA, about healthy lifestyles, stroke risk reductions and it focuses on a different risk factor each week over the course of six weeks. And there's a big emphasis on promoting physical activity, including use of pedometers and regular reviews of people's step counts as well. We know that cardiac rehabilitation is very effective after heart attacks. It's not really look, been looked at in TIA before and certainly not in a community delivered intervention. So this is quite a novel study. And the good news is that it's very effective. So those participants had improvements at 12 weeks in stroke risk factors, including blood pressure and levels of physical activity. And the really good news is that 97% of people who agreed to participate successfully managed to complete the program. So this seems to be something that is highly acceptable to patients. Given all of this, it strikes me that this intervention could easily be initiated before someone has a TIA. Imagine if people came in for their NHS health checks, we found that their Q-risk was high. Instead of offering them statins, we gave them a pedometer. I just wonder if this might get people off of tablets and off of their sofas as well. OK, for our more in-depth look, we're going to have a look at cardiovascular disease today. And this has been a real hotbed of research in recent weeks so you can't have failed to see the reports in the general media about taking antihypertensives at night and the potential benefit there. We're also going to have a look at a Cochrane review on best first line antihypertensives and then we're going to have a look at an article that I stumbled across uh, while reading the Drugs and Therapeutic Bulletin which provides some very useful information on how we can help patients who find it difficult to tolerate statins. So on the Hot Topics course, we always cover cardiovascular medicine. It's such a big topic for us in primary care. It always gets a look in. And one of the most common questions we have when we're talking about blood pressure management is, is it important if my patient is a nocturnal non-dipper? So naturally, our bodies have higher blood pressures during the day and then at night time, the blood pressure goes down. That's maintained while we're sleeping and then it starts to ramp up again as we wake up. People with hypertension will often lose that nocturnal dip and therefore further expose themselves to increased risk of cardiovascular events due to greater duration with a raised blood pressure. But it's never really been clear to me whether adjusting how we treat this hypertensive group given that many of them will already be on some antihypertensive therapy, actually makes a difference if you're a dipper or a non-dipper overnight. But what we have had is we've had some data that's previously shown if you take antihypertensives in the evenings, then that seems to improve overall blood pressure control and then has a knock-on effect with improvements in other outcomes. For some reason, this has never really seemed to translate into day-to-day -day practice. And I'm as guilty as anyone else 
Occasionally I've recommended in the past, particularly if someone's had difficulty with gaining control of their blood pressure, but it's not something that's commonplace. I've never really understood why. In some ways, this new research feels to me like it's not new news. However, what it does represent is it represents the first primary care study in this area using the gold standard method for blood pressure assessment, so ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, with a decent duration of follow-up. The rationale behind taking antihypertensives at night is that your renin, aldosterone and your tensin system is most active at night. But if you take antihypertensives in the morning, much of their effect is waning by evening. So then you're missing out on this sort of period when it'd be very, very helpful to have much better control. So by simply taking the medications at the evening, we maximise that therapeutic benefit during the night time with very little effect on the benefits you see on blood pressure during the daytime as well. So this study was performed in a Spanish Caucasian population, almost 20,000 participants randomised to either have their normal antihypertensives in the morning or in the evening, followed up for an average of just over six years. The results were very impressive. So there was an almost 50% reduction in the rate of primary cardiovascular outcomes, so death, heart attack, strokes, with this very simple intervention. It also neatly sidesteps the debate about the idea of dippers and non-dippers at night, and there's ongoing debate within cardiology circles whether it's worth identifying this group, how is it going to change management, what are we going to do if we uh, do identify these patients. If you simply take antihypertensives at night, you're going to be doing the best that you can for this group anyway. It seems such a simple thing to do. I will definitely be encouraging my patients at their next hypertensive review to switch to evening dosing. The caveat is that this was in an exclusively Caucasian Spanish population, so it needs further research in wider ethnic groups. And there still remains uncertainty of what to do if you're, for instance, someone who does shift systems, when is the best time to take your antihypertensives? The next study was a Cochrane review which looked at the best first line antihypertensives. And to cut a long story short, it found the best evidence, so the most robust evidence for thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics. So this was particularly low dose, so higher dose thiazides actually seem to have worse outcomes, beta blockers worse outcomes. Calcium channel blockers and ACE inhibitors, both effective agents, but the data they found is slightly less robust than thiazide. So they were really promoting them as a first line choice. I feel this is a slightly confusing area because actually this Cochrane review is an update from a 2009 review where it found very similar findings and yet international guidelines including our own NICE guidelines have uh, not reflected these findings. I've also seen a recent um, systematic review that seemed to suggest that there was very little difference between thiazides, calcium channel blockers and ACE inhibitors and so we could really use whichever we felt was the most appropriate for our patient. Personally, I think this is the way forward. Being too rigid with prescribing is doomed to failure, especially given the high rates of side effects that many of our patients get with antihypertensive. So choice is really, really important. Then lastly, I stumbled across this nugget of highly useful information regarding how we prescribe statins when I was reading another Drugs and Therapeutic Bulletin article which was suggesting that we stop using fibrate therapy for prevention of cardiovascular disease given the limited evidence base there and they said there is a good alternative of course to fibrates and that statins which we know are very effective agents. The big problem we've got is lots of patients seem to struggle to tolerate these medications and even in the last week I've had one of my patients who's basically said I just can't take them anymore uh, and he's at a very high risk of cardiovascular disease. So is there another way and the DTB article suggests there may be, and that's using statins either just once or maybe twice a week in those who struggle to tolerate them. And this comes from a 2015 paper published in the European Heart Journal that demonstrates that if you use a long-acting high-intensity statin, so for example, a Torva 20 or Resuva statin 5 milligrams, you can still get a meaningful reduction in someone's LDL 
in the range of something between 12 to 38 percent depending on the agent you're using and quite how um, much they're able to tolerate even if you're just using on a much more infrequent basis so as with so many things i'm amazed that this is not common knowledge why don't we try our patients on just once or twice weekly statins i think many more of them are going to be able to tolerate this sure it may not be quite as effective if they can manage it um, all week but it's going to be much more effective than if they can't manage anything at all and reduces their pill burden and potentially may reduce the risk of other statin complications such as the driving of diabetes that we've become aware of in recent years so finally, we're going to have a look at some future medicine. And uh, this is a really fascinating story about genome editing. So if you haven't heard of CRISPR before, this was a, a technique that was devised in 2012. And it's a mechanism by which scientists can create sequences of RNA. They attach it to a specific protein. That can go out then and seek the corresponding pattern in someone's DNA and the protein helps cut that segment. So this is really, really good for finding those corresponding sections and cutting them out. So that's useful if you've got perhaps an aberrant gene that you just want to remove from someone's DNA. However, it's not that great at actually inserting or replacing someone's DNA with, with new material. And that's something you might need to do in a range of conditions. So they've just updated the technology and now using an additional protein, they've actually become, they have created a technique that's highly effective at being able to actually not just cut people's DNA and remove sections, but replacing problematic areas as well. And it seems to be highly, highly effective and it basically makes CRISPR programmable and you can almost make DNA plug and play. So this is the future of genome editing, and this could have profound influence on people who have serious genetic diseases. The biggest problem has yet to be um, overcome. So that's managing to insert DNA on mass. You can do it with individual cells, but doing it into a human body is much, much more complex. That's still gonna take a bit of time, but watch this space. The promise of gene-related medicine is one step closer. So that's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us once again. Next time, we'll have more updates on the latest news and research from the last couple of weeks. We're also going to be joined by Dr. Simon Curtis, who many of you will know is the founder of um, MB Medical and the driver of the Hot Topics course over the last 21 years. We're going to be talking to him about his experiences of South African primary care when he was over there at a recent international conference speaking to local GPs. So have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Take care.